الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على أشرف الأنبياء سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها والنور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون I was given the subject to talk on the diseases of the heart but I thought an individual as diseased as I am is not worthy of talking about the diseases of the heart so I decided to cover something which will cover all the aspects of the diseases of the heart and which will cure the hearts insha'Allah Bijail Habib Al-A'zam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is something known as a salah the prayer five times a day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated on us a prayer and this salah yesterday I conversed with an, a friend who studied with me in Damascus we were together and I mentioned to him what Al Imam Ahmed bin Zaini Dahlan rahimullah said regarding the fawaid the benefits of salah and he replied back to me today morning and he said unfortunately the vast majority of the ummah have left and abandoned the salah and this hurt me because I thought one of the last words of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before leaving this world was as salah as salah as salah the prayer the prayer the prayer this shows us the importance of praying five times a day now after learning correct creed regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after learning pure tawheed learning the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his perfections learning that divine attributes learning the sifat attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing the rational proofs and knowing some of the textual proofs learning surah al-ikhlas learning surah al uh, the mu'awwidatain surah al-falaq and surah al-nas these basic aspects knowing nabuwa prophethood and risala messengership and learning basic aqeedah the first thing a person must pray is what a salah praying five times a day a sayyid abbas bin alawi rahimahullah ta'ala the son of a sayyid alawi al-maliki a sayyid alawi al-maliki is the father of a sayyid muhammad bin alawi al-maliki rahimahullah a sayyid abbas only visited england once a few years back and when he did he brought with him a risala a book which had seven uh, six uh, small booklets in one and he gave me a copy of that and he said to me get this book translated into English and in that book was the works of a Sayyid Ahmed bin Zaini Dahlan rahimahullah ta'ala who was the Mufti of Makkah al mukarramah in his time the Mufti of the Ottoman Empire they say regarding a Sayyid Ahmed bin Zaini Dahlan rahimahullah that he knew Sahih al-Bukhari so well he knew it like someone knows Surah al-Fatiha and he would go into a Makki Haram in Al-Masjid al-Haram may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us there and he would teach 70 students after after Salat al-Maghrib when he would finish the dars each student of those 70 students would go and have his own halqa his own circle of knowledge teaching 10 ulama so those 70 students were 70 ulama and each alim then would go and after isha salah would have his own halqa ilm his own circle of knowledge in makkah al mukarrama this is how he spread knowledge in makkah al mukarrama and he would go into the poor areas, poor districts of Makkah al-Mukarramah and other parts of the Arabian Peninsula and teach people Islam, teach them the basics because there are three aspects to Islam. Islam, Iman and Ihsan. So when you start a book, you learn the basic creed. Of course we learn آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالُ وَالْبَعَثِ بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ and we learn amantu billahi kama huwa yes all this al iman mujmal and al iman mufassal but then the details of that meaning the basic proofs were knowing the existence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basic proofs 
for the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many times I came to uh, different towns and I tend to teach the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the attributes of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second aspect is fiqh, meaning jurisprudence, you learn how to perform wudu correctly, you perform wudu correctly, you pray your salah correctly. The third aspect is known as ihsan, which is and the, defined best by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. And ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarahu fa illam takun tarahu fa innahu yaraq. Which means that you worship Allah like you see him. And if you do not see him, then know he sees you. And this is a state of the heart. And to, to attain this state, a person needs to remove the illnesses, the ailments of the heart. But of course, talking about the ailments of the heart, what people of the outward sciences can do, like myself, is they can tell you, this is the illness, this is the cure. This is the illness, this is the cure. You have takabur, arrogance in your heart, the cure is go sit with fuqara and masakin, poor people. Go eat with them, go sit next to them and eat with them. It removes takabur, arrogance from the heart. We can tell you hasad, envy, is wanting a favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to someone, wanting that for yourself and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove it from that person. So the cure is go supplicate for that person behind his back and praise him amongst people when he is not present. Because the hasid, he praises the person on his face. But the one who is not a hasid, an envier, he praises him behind his back. The illness of the heart, of ghibah, which is the illness of the tongue, so common today, like abandoning the prayer, like we abandon the prayer, people, Muslims, they abandon the prayer. In the same way, ghibah of the tongue is so common, namima is so common. Let me tell you a, a nukta, a point regarding namima. We know the hadith in the Sahih of Imam al Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by the graves of two men, both of whom were being punished. One was being punished for having urine on his clothes. The other one was being punished for namima, gossip. A point which Al-Imam Ahmad al-Safarini rahimahullah ta'ala al-Hanbali, one of the Hanabila of Damascus, he mentions regarding this hadith. And that point is, why did the punishment of the first man start from the urine and why did the punishment of the second man start from namima gossip? The reason is that the obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set upon us are two. Hukukul ibad and hukukullah. The rights of the servants and the rights of Allah. So hukukullah, hukukul ibad. The rights of Allah and the rights of the servants. The first right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after iman is worshipping him. Which is the first form of worshipping is a salah. Yes. In order for salah to be valid, your, your clothes and your body and the place you pray in must be clean, purified. And if you have urine on your clothes, then your ibadah is rejected. So the punishment of the grave when it comes to the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts from purification, which is urine first. So the man was being punished for urine. The hukuk al-ibad, the greatest right, the, the ibad, the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have is the blood. Meaning you cannot kill another human being. You cannot kill another Muslim. But how does bloodshed start? Bloodshed starts with namima, gossip. One person goes and tells a group of people, this person said this. Then that group goes and backbites the other group. Then that person, the gossip carrier, the tail bearer will go to that group and say, they said this. And that will lead to backbiting. Backbiting leads to enmity. Enmity leads to hatred. Hatred leads to violence. Violence leads to killing, which is the greatest haqq of the ibad, the right of the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, therefore, even illnesses of the tongue, illnesses of the eye, illnesses of the body, all this relates to the heart that if the heart in saluha saluha al kulluhu that if it is sound the whole body will be sound the heart 
So Al-Ihsan, Maqam Al-Ihsan, which is the third stage of Islam, when you learn Islam, you should learn these three basic aspects. The basic creed, the basic fiqh, ibadah, the amount you need, meaning everyone needs to know tahara. Everyone needs to know salah, meaning the prayer five times a day. Everyone, most people would need to know regarding zakat, charity. Most people would need to learn regard, regarding hajj. Everyone nearly, most people would need to learn about psalm, fasting. But then there is maqam al-ihsan. But maqam al-ihsan, the diseases of the heart, is it related to, is it maqam al-ihsan or is it the second one, Islam, the diseases of the heart? The response is that it is in relation to fiqh, jurisprudence. The diseases of the heart are not maqam al-ihsan. They are to do with fiqh because fiqh is knowing the legal rulings relating to the outward body and knowing the legal rulings relating to the heart. But removing the illnesses of the heart will lead you to maqam al-ihsan because then you will feel the sweetness of the prayer. So, so many people say, when we started praying, we would feel the sweetness of the prayer. But as we continued praying, we don't feel that sweetness of the prayer as we did. Meaning we would feel the sweetness of the prayer to such an extent that when we would want to pray, we would want to go to the masjid and pray. So why have they lost that sweetness of the prayer? Of course, there are reasons, asbab, why they have lost the, the sweetness of the prayer. If you are congreg congregating in the masjid, only to have a social gathering and there's no ikhlas, there's no sincerity, meaning there's no, uh, al, the hadith states, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى That the actions are judged by intentions and every individual will get what he intended. So when you attend the masjid, you attend the five daily prayers, are you intending in salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar that surely the prayer prohibits a person from fahsha? Fuhish meaning despicable acts and rejected acts. So if you, you are praying five times a day and your prayer is not stopping you from al-fahsha wal-munkar, then you are praying the prayer incorrectly. So you need to learn your fiqh. But even then, if you are still praying correctly and the prayer is not stopping you from certain actions, then it is the illnesses of the heart, the ailments of the heart. It's a farida, an obligation to learn regarding the ailments of the heart. But the text that a Sayyid Abbas bin Alawi rahimahullah ta'ala gave, I then gave to a friend of mine who translated that book. So the book is available in English. So here's the book, Prayer, Two tre uh, uh, Treatises on Its Merits and Rulings in the Hanafi School. The first one by Shaykh Ahmad bin Ibn Zaini Dahlan rahimahullah. This, in fact, is from the Hassanat, the good deeds of a Sayyid Abbas bin Alawi rahimahullah ta'ala that the book has been translated into English. In fact, he wanted us to make a chart. The, the chart should have the benefits and virtues of the prayer and also the punishments of the prayer. Now, I've already had a hand in the chart of the 50 essential beliefs. Some people have designed a chart with 50 essential beliefs after listening to my speech. So I hope my speech today encourages someone to make a chart with the virtues of the prayer and the punishments for abandoning the prayer. As-salatu imadu deen Prayer is what? The pillar of religion. As-salatu imadu deen That prayer is the pillar of, the, uh, the, uh, of religion, of a deen. So from this book, he states, No, may Allah have mercy on you, that whoever consistently maintains his prayer, Allah honors him with five privileges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him five privileges. Listen to the benefits before we go on to the punishments. Your heart will be happy at the benefits. Maybe our hearts will be saddened when we hear the punishments. Number one, his livelihood is expanded. Meaning, the person's risk is expanded by praying five times a day. Number two, he is saved from the torment in the grave, meaning the prayer is a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops the torment in the grave. Number three, 
He gives him his scroll of deeds in his right hand on the day of judgment. His scroll will be given to him in the right hand, meaning this is the group of people who will enter paradise. Number four, he will pass over the bridge that is over the fire, meaning over hellfire, like lightning. Because of the blessings of the prayer of Salah. Number five, and he will enter paradise without reckoning. Now some people may say, I abandoned prayer for so long. How am I able to make up for all those prayers I missed? The answer is, there is an easy method, not the common method that people say, which is, you, at the end of the day, you, you stand in a room and you attempt to pray the qada of one day. No. When Dhuhr prayer comes in, you pray your full sunnah, you pray your full fard, you pray your two sunnah, and you pray one qada of Dhuhr, full fard of Dhuhr. When Asr prayer comes in, you pray four fard of one qada of Asr and four fard of the Asr prayer that you are in. When Maghrib time comes in, you pray three fard, three ob obligatory cycles, and then you pray two sunnah and you pray three fard additional. When Isha prayer comes in, you pray the four fard, the two sunnah, the three with. And then you pray also a full fard of Isha Qada and the three with which are wajib. When Fajr prayer comes in, you pray two fard of the first Qada of Fajr that you missed, and you pray two sunnah and two fard. If you do this and you died doing this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshaAllah bi rahmatillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all the qadas that you have ever missed because you are in the action of rectifying yourself you are in the process of rectifying yourself and never miss the prayer after this some people they miss prayer why because they think if i go prayer if i go to pray dhuhr i would have to pray four sunnah four fard two sunnah Two nafal. This is in the Hanafi school. Of course, the other schools are relaxed. That's why you see the Shafi'is, they enter the masjid, pray their fard and go home. It's nafal in their schools. Unfortunately, the way our community is that some people, if they knew a man who only came in and prayed his full fard and left, they would condemn him. But if they knew a man who did not pray five times a day, they will never condemn him. So because of this, so many people have left the prayer. So if you are not praying your sunnah prayer and because of that you are abandoning the fard prayer then it is better for you to pray your fard prayer and miss the sunnah. I'm not encouraging people to miss the sunnah. I am saying this is to clarify because later on people object. A clarification. If you are missing your five daily prayers you're missing your fard prayer. If you are abandoning your fard prayer because of the number of sunnah prayers then you should pray your fart prayer and leave the sunnah prayer one day what will happen when you continue praying your fart prayer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enable you to pray your sunnah prayer yes so never abandon the fart prayer secondly the congregation praying in jama'a is one of the means by which the prayer is made easy in one position of the Hanbali school, if you do not pray your uh, prayer in jama'ah, in congregation, your prayer is not done. So you will find Bedouins who are Hanbali, they become stringent on jama'ah and congregation. They must find someone to pray jama'ah with. Otherwise their prayer is not done. So always pray or attempt to pray in congregation. Now what are the punishments for abandoning the prayer? Al-Imam Ahmed bin Zaini Dahlan states, while whoever is complacent with regards to his prayer, Allah will punish him with 15 kinds of punishment, six in this world, three at death, three when he enters the grave, and three when he meets his Lord, namely during the standing for reckoning on the day of resurrection. As for those in this world, they are. So he counts the punishments that are in this world. But before we go on to this, 
I want some, everyone to pay attention to the following. He states, many hadiths have come demonstrating that the one who forsakes the prayer is a disbeliever. And many of the companions have adopted this view based on the purport of these hadiths amongst them. Meaning, whoever abandons the prayer according to some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is a kafir. So which companions held this belief? Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab. Sayyiduna Abdul Rahman bin Awf. Sayyiduna Mu'adh bin Jabal. Sayyiduna Abu Huraira. Sayyiduna Ibn Mas'ud. Sayyiduna Abdullah bin, Mas Abdullah bin Abbas. Sayyiduna Jabir bin Abdullah. And Sayyiduna Abu Darda radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Ten companions, he has, uh, eight companions. He has listed who believed that whoever abandons the five daily prayers becomes a kafir. They held this position. So if someone was in their company and prayer time came in and they didn't pray, they would think the person is a kafir. This is why he is not praying. This is so common, so common in our communities that this habit people have retained from Pakistan. In Pakistan, the adhan happens in the masjid, in the village masjid, yet people will be busy with their dogs. People will be uh, busy with the titter. Yes, but what is it called? But, and there's another one. Patere, they will be busy with. Patere, and they will abandon the prayer. Yes, that habit has come down into this country also because people have migrated from there. That salah time comes in and people are standing around as if there is nothing nothing to do they'll sit around and talk but when we as a community change that the vast majority of us and remember we're not expecting everyone to change when the overwhelming majority is such that the salah time comes in and they are standing they say salah time has come let's go pray or if they're in the home if it's easy for them they can go to the masjid and if it's inconvenient let's pray jama'ah congregation in the house when the majority of our community becomes like this, then all these other ailments, the side effects that we cry about, will all disappear. There are so many side effects to not praying, meaning we discuss other things, social problems and other problems, but if we are abandoning the prayer, which is the first obligation of the religion, what change do we expect? Which Imams believed it's kufr to abandon the prayer? Al-Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Al-Imam Ishaq bin Rahuweh, Al-Imam Abdullah bin Al-Mubarak, student of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Ibrahim al nakhi and a, whole, a large group of others, they said whoever abandons a prayer is a kafir. So you can imagine how major the sin is to abandon the prayer, the salah. That if you abandon the salah, how major this sin is. But if you have been abandoning the prayer, you can make tawbah and make qada of the prayer. How do you make qada? The method I told you. The method I told you is the easiest method of qada. Then, what are the punishments of abandoning the prayer? We said six punishments in the worldly life. Six punishments are mentioned for abandoning the prayer in the worldly life. Some people find prayer difficult because of practicalities. How? What practicalities? Tahara. So they will say, we cannot pray today because I have najasa impurity on the clothes so many people mention this excuse how do we counter this excuse unless the, the najasa is bigger than your palm unless the najasa is bigger than your palm your prayer is still valid meaning the fuqaha the jurists in the hanafi school mention that if you place water on the palm the amount of water that remains some people say 50 pence coin but a better example is if you place water on your palm, the amount of water that remains on your flat palm, if the najasa is that big or more, then your prayer will be invalid. If it's that much, your prayer will be makru. If it's more, your prayer will be invalid. So you tell me which person who has sanity walks around with najas, that much najasa on his clothes. Do you have that much urine or excrement or blood or semen on your clothes? Of course not. So anyone who makes this excuse, 
We have this much najasa, uh, we have so much najasa on our clothes. Is the najasa exceeding this amount? Such a person should go home, take a bath and change his clothes. Yes? In the same way some people say, uh, whenever we, they think if they pass wind, they would have to do istinja. So many people think this. If they pass wind, they would have to do istinja. When this is not the case, why do they think this? Because they haven't learned basic fiqh, basic jurisprudence. That whenever you pass wind, you have to do istinja. The fact is, wudu is so easy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us facilities like hot water in this country. Remember, some people say if you do wudu in cold water, your reward increases. That is not true. What the hadith means is if you happen to do wudu and the water happened to be cold, you have no other water, then your reward is increased. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not legislated ibadah worship to make it hard upon us, difficult. The purpose of the ibadah is not to make things difficult for us. The difficulty that is attained during ibadah is a side product, a side effect of certain situations. For instance, you slept late because you were traveling, you woke up for fajr prayer, you were fatigued. Now when you are fatigued, the fatigue is not the purpose of your prayer. But you will be rewarded for waking up. Now this brings us to fajr prayer. That when we think about fajr prayer, when, if a person oversleeps, when does he become sinful for abandoning the fajr prayer? The answer is, if he was the cause of abandoning fajr prayer, meaning he was the cause of abandoning the fajr prayer, how? that he stayed awake all night playing on PlayStation, yes, or talking to friends, or standing in a billiard hall, a snooker hall, until three in the morning, or even sitting around in the masjid eating pizza just to, to gossip and backbite, because now the Islamic groups also have these subgroups. Every group backbites, another group, every scholar, his little followers backbite the followers of the other scholar, and even sometimes the scholars are involved, Abdul Rahman ibn Jawzi rahimullah says that the that hasad envy is most common amongst ulama, amongst the scholars. Illa ma sha Allah, except the ones Allah wills for, that they keep themselves away from this. So what happens? A person talks till three and four in the morning, and then he goes home to sleep. When Fajr time enters, he is too tired to wake up. Is he sinful? The answer is yes. Why? Because he was the cause of his fatigue. But another man went to sleep at nine in the, in the late afternoon or in the evening at nine o'clock. And when he went to sleep, he put his alarm clock on and he intended to wake up for Fajr. But his body was too fatigued and he missed Fajr. Then all he would have to do is Qadha. That is the person who is not sinful because he made, he facilitated for himself to pray the Fajr prayer. So how do you wake up for Fajr? The best method is that go to sleep early, meaning after Isha. It is so common for our people today to congregate after Isha. When the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was after Isha with the exception of Majalisul Ilm, with the exception of Majalisul Ilm or gatherings of knowledge or when it was absolutely necessary to meet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions would go to sleep. Then they were able to wake up for tahajjud. Never mind fajr prayer, they would wake up for tahajjud. No one would know that they have uh, woken up for tahajjud. They would pray tahajjud. But what is the best method? After Isha prayer, apart from work and family. And when I say family, I mean parents and wife and children. That's what is meant by family, not your uncle's son or your brother's children who want to contact you or your far relatives who want to meet up. No, family means parents, wife and children. Apart from them, you do not meet anyone after Isha, then you go to sleep early. And before you go to sleep, have two glasses of water. <coughs> drink two glasses of water. If you want, drink milk. What will that do? When you go to sleep, you will not only wake up for Fajr, you will wake up for Tahajjud as well. Meaning, you will have the, your bladder will be full, your body will wake up. These are practical ways of waking up for Fajr prayer. Also, 
we know that if you recite Suratul Ikhlas, this is not from the Sunnah, it's from uh, the scholars who mention this. It's not from the Sunnah in case someone says it's a bid'ah to do this. Uh, the Suratul Ikhlas, three times, if you recite Suratul Ikhlas, three times, and intend to wake up for Fajr prayer, inshallah, you will wake up. Yes? There are other methods as well. Now, what are the six punishments on earth for abandoning the prayer? So, practicalities of prayer, when you become habitual in praying, don't make your prayer a robot prayer. You see, there are so many people we know that who do pray five times a day, the beard will be this big, double fist, not one fist, double fist. And the mu'amala, the dealings when it comes to money, the mu'amala will be bad. You, you, you loan them uh, 2,000 pound, they'll never pay you back. Yes? What, this person will be in the front row. What does that mean? Meaning the prayer is not affecting his heart. The same person will pray in the front row, but when it comes to the marriages of his daughters and children, he'll be the number one troublemaker in those marriages, break up families. I've seen this myself because people call me to the meetings and the man will have this big beard and I will say, have some shame. Meaning the beard itself is just hair that grows on the face. It becomes good when the person's intention is to grow it for the correct intention, not to cover up his fraud because you may get some businessmen who are fraudsters, they'll grow their beard this big. Why? So people can trust them. So. Salah, in the same way, I know so many people who pray five times a day, but when it comes to business, they become stingy, they become bukhala. So in this regard, the prayer is not affecting them. Why? Because they have a robotic prayer. So we're running away from robotic prayers also, meaning robotic prayers, you go to the masjid, then you do the sajda and the ruku, and you grow the beard, but there's no practicality in the akhlaq, in the manners. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to uh, beautify our akhlaq. Amen. So, Amen. the six punishments in the worldly life. Number one, blessings, barakah be, will be taken away from his life. Number two, the mark of the righteous will be erased from his face. Number three, Allah will not reward him for any deed he performs. The exception is salawat, but according to salawat and salam upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but according to the companions who deemed him as a kafir, his actions are not accepted. His supplication will not be raised to the sky for acceptance. Number five, he has no portion of the supplications of the righteous. So even if the pious people mention him, his name will be excluded. Number six, and his soul will exit his body at death without faith, without Iman. As for those that he will be afflicted with at death, they are that he will die humiliated. Number two, hungry. Number three, thirsty. In fact, even if he was given to drink from the oceans of the world, he will, would not be quenched. As for the, those that will afflict him in his grave, they are Allah will compress his grave on him such that his ribs will be squeezed. <coughs> Number two, <coughs> a fire will be kindled in his grave <coughs> and he will be const constantly turning over the cold night and day. <coughs> Read Salawat. <coughs> Number three, and a snake called a shuja al-aqra, the brave and bold, <coughs> will be set upon him in the grave, beating him for neglecting his prayers, and his, and his punishing him will continue for the duration of the prayer times, I mean for each prayer time. As for those that will befall him when meeting his Lord, they are number one, when the heaven split asunder, an angel will come to him <coughs> with a chain, the length of 70 arms span in his hand, that he will drag around his neck. He will then insert it in his mouth and will emerge through his anus. All the while the angel will be shouting, 
This is the recompense for whoever neglects Allah's obligations. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, if a single ring from the chain was to fall on earth, it will burn it. Number two, Allah will not look at him. Number three, and he will not punish him, uh, and he will not purify him of his sins, and he will have a painful torment. It is related, the first thing that will be blackened on the day of resurrection will be the faces of those who forsake their prayer. And that in Jahannam, there is a valley called Lam Lam, in which the, there will be snakes. Each snake is the thickness of a camel head and its length the distance of a month that will bite the one who forsakes the prayer and its poison will boil in his body for 70 years and then his flesh, flesh shall disintegrate. Furthermore, it is related that whoever consistently performs the five daily prayers in congregation, so yes, for Dail of Jama'ah, these are the punishments for abandoning the prayer. So how do we start praying? Firstly, let's all of us make the intention of never to abandon the prayer from today. Meaning, we will pray the prayer and we will order our families to pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Al-Quran Al-Kareem, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Order your families to pray, وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا and seek patience upon it. Why seek patience? Because prayer needs patience, meaning you need patience because it goes against the ego. Prayer hurts the ego, it hurts laziness, it, hurt, it hurts every aspect of our ego, the five daily prayers. But when you order your families, does this mean now all your life you've been missing prayer and then you go hajj and grow a beard and then you order your son who's reached 20 now that he must pray and become harsh to him? No. Meaning your prayer will not affect your family unless you are praying your prayer not like a robot. Meaning the prayer is from the heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify our states. Aqulu qawli adha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa atubu ilayh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.